Welcome to Bible Essentials. My name is Sarah Ruff. We are getting close to the end of our Zechariah study. We are studying chapters 12 and 13 today. So if you've got your Bibles, open them up. I would love for you to be reading along with me. Um, it, chapter 12 verse 1 says this, the word, an oracle, the word of the Lord concerning Israel. So we are getting ready to read about Israel. It's the word concerning Israel, a declaration of the Lord who stretched out the heavens, laid the foundations of the earth, and formed the spirit of man within him. That's the God we serve. Look, verse 2, look, I will make Jerusalem a cup that causes staggering for the peoples who surround the city. The siege against Jerusalem will also involve Judah, not just Jerusalem, but Judah. On that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who try to lift it will injure themselves severely when, when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her. So listen, in chapter 11, we saw where the nations were had taken Lebanon, had taken the gorgeous big cedars of Lebanon, and it was working. They were working their way south. Well, in chapter 12, they're there. They have reached Jerusalem and Judah. But he says, I'm going to make Jerusalem like a cup that causes staggering for the people who have surrounded her. He said, when they try to lift, when they try to lift Jerusalem, I'm going, they are going to injure themselves. How? What, what is, what is the Lord talking about? Verse four. On that day, the Lord's declaration, I will strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness. I will keep a watchful eye on the house of Judah and strike the horses of the nations with blindness. Then each of the leaders of Judah will think to himself, the residents of Jerusalem are my strength through the Lord of hosts, their God. So he's saying those in Judah are going to think, oh, we've got to get to Jerusalem or Jerusalem has got to help us. But that is not the case. Look, verse six, it says, on that day, I will make the leaders of Judah like a fire pot in a wood pile, like a flaming torch among the sheaves. Well, what is that like? It tells us they will consume all the peoples around them to the right and to the left, while Jerusalem continues to be inhabited on its site in Jerusalem, meaning those in Jerusalem and the stronghold of Jerusalem will not have to go out and fight for Judah. They will not have to because the Lord will cause Judah to be able to fight and to consume all those around him to the left and to the right. The Lord will save the tents of Judah first. Why? So that the glory of David's house and the glory of Jerusalem's residents may not be greater than that of Judah. Meaning no one will have to go help each other. The Lord is going to fight for them, for each person, each group, each wherever they are. Verse 8, on that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the one who is weakest among them will be like David on that day and the house of David will be like the angel of the Lord before them. On that day, I will set out to destroy, listen, on that day, I, the Lord, will set out to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Verse 10. Then, then, listen, then I, speaking of the Lord, I will pour out my spirit, a spirit of grace and prayer on the house of David and the residents of Jerusalem. And they will look at me whom they pierced. They will mourn for him, the one they pierced, as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly for him as one weeps for a firstborn. On that day, the mourning in Jerusalem will be as great as the mourning of Hadad Renum in the plain of Megiddo. We'll read about that in a minute. The land will mourn every family by itself. 
the family of David's house by itself and their women by themselves and the family of Nathan's house by itself and their women by themselves, the family of, Le the family of Levi's house by itself and their women by themselves and the family of Shammai by itself and the women by themselves, all the remaining families, every family by itself and their women by themselves will mourn. But listen, the only reason why there is mourning and that they see the one whom they pierce, let me read you some scripture on this. Ezekiel 20 or Ezekiel 39, 29 says this, and I will not hide my face from them anymore for I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. Joel 2, 20, 2, 28 through 29 says, And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and my maid servants will I pour out my spirit in those days. Romans eleven twenty five through 27 says this, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. So Israel has been blinded in part until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So the Lord will pour out his spirit on the whole house of Israel and they will finally see their Messiah. Notice it's not that the Jews see, just decide to, oh, I'm going to follow after the Lord or now I'm going to follow his commands. Uh, it's not that. It is because the Lord gave them his spirit, poured out his spirit on them, that they see him, that they mourn, that they recognize him, and that, as you will read later on, that they will continually and forever follow the Lord. Uh, speaking of whom they pierced, let me read to you a couple verses. John 19, 31 through 37 says, Since it was preparation day, the Jews did not want the bodies to remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a special day. They requested that Pilate had the men's legs broken and that their bodies be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other one who had been crucified with him. When they came to Jesus, they did not break his legs since they saw that he was already dead. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true and he knows he is telling the truth for these things happened so that scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. Also, another scripture says, they will look on the one they pierced. Speaking of Christ, of Jesus. Revelation 1, 7 says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even, the one, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. So they, because God is going to pour out his spirit and remove their sin in a single day. Remember, that was the vision of Joshua the high priest in filthy clothes. And he was told to take off that filthy clothes. And that was that vision that they that the nation of Israel would have their sins cleansed in a single day. Let's talk about mourning really quickly. They will be mourning. And just so you know, just a little more insight in mourning that even in Israel today, that if there is a death, 
the immediate family goes to a house and they mourn. And then their relatives and their friends and everyone else will come and serve them and bring them meals while they are mourning. But notice here that everyone is mourning by themselves, even the women, everyone. It's very personal. Everyone sees Christ, the one they pierced, and they mourn for him. And it says they mourn like that of Hadad Remen in the plain of Megiddo. Well, what was that like? There's just a little blip in scripture. Let me read it to you in 2 Chronicles 35, 20 through 35. It says, After all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, came up to fight against Carchemish, fight against Carchemish by the Euphrates, Euphrates. And Josiah went out against him, but he sent messengers to him, saying, What have I to do with you, king of Judah? I have not come against you this day, but against the house with which I have war. For God commanded me to make haste. Refrain from meddling with God who is with me, lest he destroy you. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself so that he might fight with him and did not heed the words of Necho from the mouth of God. So he came to fight in the valley of Megiddo. Verse 23, And the archers shot King Josiah, and the king said to his servants, Take me away, for I am severely wounded. His servants therefore took him out of that chariot and put him in the second chariot that he had, and they brought him to Jerusalem. So he died and was buried in one of the tombs of his fathers. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. Jeremiah also lamented for Josiah. And to this day, all the singing men and singing women speak of Josiah in their lamentations. They're lamenting. They made it a custom in Israel and decided... And indeed, they are written in the laments. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah, his goodness, according to what was written in the law of the Lord and his deeds, from the first to the last, indeed, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. So to this day, they lament the death of Josiah. And so that is the context here. Okay, so why mention the house of David, the family of David, the family of Nathan, the family of Levi, and the family of Shammai. These seem like very random names. David, not so much in Levi, but Nathan and Shammai. Have you ever heard of Shammai? Well, let me just tell you there are two options here. Number one, Nathan is said to that... Scripture does tell us that David had a son named Nathan, but nothing was ever said about him. Scripture does tell us that Levi had a son, Shammai, but nothing is ever said about him. So it could be saying that David and his descendants, Levi and his descendants, were saw the Lord and mourned, but I think there's a more plausible, there's a more plausible reason that these names are mentioned. I think because all these names, David, Nathan, Nathan, remember, was the prophet of David. The Levites served in the temple during David's reign. And Shammai was a Benjaminite who cursed David. And it's recorded in 2 Samuel 16, it is recorded how when Absalom was trying to take the kingdom from his dad, David, and David had to leave Jerusalem, on the way, this Benjaminite, Shammai, curses David. Oh, calls him a murderer and how he tells him to get out. We don't want you. God is just cursing you. And David's head head warriors were saying, let us just kill this dead dog. Let us get rid of Shammai. And David says, no, we can't get rid of him because I know the Lord is the one that is causing him to do this. And so David purposed not to kill Shammai. 
Now, fast forward, when David was giving his kingdom to his son, Solomon, he warned Solomon about this Shammai, this Benjaminite. He says, hey, I just want you to know that this Shammai cursed me and spoke maliciously about me, so you need to keep a watch on him. So when Solomon then comes to the throne, he calls Shammai to him and he says, okay, my father said he would not kill you and I will not kill you either, but you have to go to Jerusalem, build a house in Jerusalem and you cannot leave there or else I will kill you. And so Shammai said that was fair and good and he went to Jerusalem and built his house, but his donkeys left the city and he went after his donkeys and someone told King Solomon. And so Solomon then had reason to kill Shammai. And let me read to you in 1 Kings 2, 46, it says, Then the king, speaking of Solomon, commanded Benaniah, son of Jehoiada, and he went out and struck Shammai down, and he died and this is key. So the kingdom was established in Solomon's hand. So with the death of Shammai, this one who cursed, cursed David and cursed that lineage, Solomon's Solomon's uh, kingdom was established. And I think that is the word picture here. That yes, the king, the prophet, the priest, and the least in the kingdom are mourning over the one they pierced. And the kingdom of Christ will be established. All right, moving on to chapter 13 very quickly. On that day, on the day when there is, when the Lord pours out his spirit and there's great mourning over the Messiah whom they have rejected all this time, but now they see him for his Messiah. On that day, a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the residents of Jerusalem to wash away sin and impurity. Again, that goes back to that, to that vision of of um, the Joshua the high priest in filthy clothes and them taking off his filthy clothes and the Lord removing their iniquities, their sin, their guilt in a single day. Verse two, on that day, the declaration of the Lord of hosts, I will erase the names of the idols from the land and they will no longer be remembered. I will remove the prophets and the unclean spirits from the land. Ooh, don't miss that, that there are unclean spirits in the land. God is going to remove them. Verse three, if a man still prophesies, his mother and his, his father and his mother who bore him will say to him, you cannot remain alive because you have spoken falsely in the name of the Lord. And that's key. That's why these prophets can't remain alive because they are false prophets. He, when he prophesies, his mother and father who bore him will pierce him through. On that day, every prophet will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. And the reason why they're going to be ashamed because they didn't come true. They were prophesying falsely. They will not put on a hairy cloak in order to deceive. He will say, I am not a prophet. I am a tiller of the soil for a man purchased me as a servant since my youth. If someone asks him, what are these wounds on your chest? Remember the false prophets of Baal, how they would gash themselves and nick themselves and bleed to call on their God. This is, I think, what is being referenced here, this self-mutilation. It says, if someone asks him, what are these wounds on your chest? Then he will answer the wounds I received in the house of my friends. Sword awake against my shepherd, against the man who is my associate. The declaration of the Lord of hosts, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. He's speaking about his first coming. This is Matthew 26, 31. He says, I will also turn my hand against the little ones in the whole land, the Lord of hosts declaration. Two thirds will be cut off and die. Two thirds 
of the Jews will be cut off and die, but a third will be left in it. I will put this third through the fire. Why? I will refine them as silver is refined, and I will test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is our God. So we are just seeing more and more of what is taking place. How, yes, God is going to destroy two-thirds of his people, but he's going to keep a remnant. He always saves a remnant, and he will fill them with his spirit so they will see him and mourn for him. All right, next week we're going to finish this out with chapter 14. I hope you'll join me for it.